Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the last episode that we're recording this year, probably, very likely. Yeah, I would think so. Maybe not the last released. Anyway, my name is Patrick, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Macadoodle Doo. Happy New Year! Am I too early on that one? Yeah, a bit. Oh, (laughs) shit. Well, well. we're ending the year on a we're ending the year on a high note, though. Like we're just today, we hit the once again we broke the top two hundred of Apple Podcasts again. We're at number one eighty one, so we went back up on those charts. Like Apple Podcasts for history, or Apple Podcasts in general? History. Oh, is this like general history then? Yes, exactly. Oh, cool. All history combined. That's kind of cool. So yeah. thank you, listeners, for making Thanks, that. people who listen. <laughs> Just all of them. Um, and all two of you. My mother and Patrick's mother. <laughs> Obviously, before we get started, we would like to thank our patrons and all of that jazz. You know who you are. It's always great to have your support. If you want to support uh, the show, you can do so for a couple of dollars a month, get access to bonus content, early content, all of that cool stuff. Um, And yeah, it can make a good Christmas present, either for yourself or for a loved one. So there you go. Consider it and have fun. Um, In the spirit of Christmas, um, I figured we would do a proper holiday episode and uh talk about labor unions and striking nice because that makes perfect sense <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah this was this has nothing to do with christmas technically um i don't think christmas is mentioned even once I but mean, uh, <laughs> if we want to get technical about it the current capitalism christmas mindset is actually the opposite of what was intended from uh, a christmas carol it is very true that is very true Um, christmas carol is supposed to be communist propaganda and this is on and you know what workers rights and revolutions baby throwing off the chains i mean look i'm not gonna be the one discounting those that right now (laughs) for for listeners may have known that i am currently in the midst of what is the biggest labor union strike in quebec's history i think in the last 50 years right it's a we've i think the biggest ones uh since 1974 or something like that so 60 years um so that's cool there's like 500,000 public service workers that are on strike because they want to maintain just the their salary to inflation which apparently the government is too stubborn to do so great job right there um and other things but i'm not gonna but hey i'm not gonna let's talk about spend it like, seven million dollars for hockey bullshit <laughs> or just let's not have a shred of decency and let's actively make our employees and population poor over the next coming years let's give ourselves a 30 percent raise and then say there's no money for public workers let's offer a 25 percent raise to sq pops that they will have the balls to refuse <laughs> because they're cops they know they mm-hmm. can get it <laughs> so like good 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 for them good for everyone good for involved them. yep truly truly a good time to be alive the um, system is not broken shut up no it's working it's not broken it's working exactly as it was intended to <laughs> <laughs> we're not bitter you're a bitter asshole Am I wrong? <laughs> no. Exactly. Like you can agree with it. That's fine. Good on you, listener who agrees with it, but it's working exactly as it's intended. Um okay. So today, all jokes aside and all ranting aside, we are talking about um Michael Andachi's novel In the Skin of a Lion, which I love. I like Michael Andachi in general. I think he's a really good writer. Um mm-hmm. and we're we're talking about it in relation to what is probably the best known strike in Canadian history, which is the Winnipeg General Strike, which happened 
right around the time Winnipeg. that the events of the novel. Yeah, like the only good thing that came out of Winnipeg. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Good on you, Winnipeg. You're a city of drug addicts. You're a okay in my book. <laughs> No, but um, like basically the Winnipeg general strike takes place right around the same time and deals with issues that are similar to Michael Ondaatje's novel, which takes place in 1920s Toronto and deals with immigrant labor and um, unsung heroes of construction. So figured it would be a good parallel uh, in this case. But uh, yeah, Mac, what do you know about the Winnipeg general strike? We'll start off with the classic question here. Uh, but it's a strike. It started in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. It was pretty mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's a strike, so I'm guessing it was something about rights for workers and unions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the industry took it very well, okay. and I'm sure the I'm sure the federal government did a great job of enfor enforcing themselves in a polite and respectful manner, and there was no cases of like brutality. Everybody was treated very respectfully and civilly. There you go. We don't need to talk about it. Um, it was very successful. So it's over. Yep. But in, in a more general level, and we'll we'll talk about this, I think, more in the next episode that we'll produce in the new year, because we're going to continue on this topic, I feel. But the what do you know about the history of labor relations in Canada? Like, um, was there general openness? And this is pretty similar in like North America. Was there openness to things like trade unionism and um, things like this for a part of Canadian history or um, any part um, of North American history? Like, what do you know? If about I remember that? correctly, it's it was fairly rocky for a while. Mm. And as far as Canada workers' rights and everything goes, the only example that comes to my mind is the goddamn railway, because we can't yeah. escape the railway ever. And I know that was pretty shit conditions all around <laughs> and if that sets the tone i gotta imagine that if people are taking their cues from the railroad construction it's not going to go well right yeah um so that's i think like the, your 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 point of saying that there's a that it was a rocky road is pretty accurate um so like at this time that we're talking about here in the early 19 20s late 1910s hmm. the uh, actual ability to join a union and to form a union was relatively recent as far as canadian history is concerned like mm -hmm. we have to situate ourselves in a time when a lot of industrialization or modern industrialization had just happened right workers had virtually no rights because how do you determine rights in something so relatively new as the industrial society, right? And also because you'd have to pay workers better wages, and a lot of people didn't want to do that. You, right? You, right? So, yeah, d disgusting. Um, and I'm just looking it up here because I forgot. But yeah, the actual ability to form a union, right, was we talked about this, was done under the John A. Macdonald government in 1872. It was one of um, one of the acts that passed under his own government, um, which is surprising considering it's a conservative government, but hey, good on him. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything was hunky-dory afterwards, right? Um, you know, technically, you could legalize all unions and trade unions and all of that, and there were certain protections, but there were also, for a long time, um, restrictions or a lack of restrictions on whether or not employers could hire people to break up strikes, for mm -hmm. example, or um, even pose counter, uh, counter propaganda or counter arguments to avoid uh, workers from wanting to unionize in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So there was very much some back and forth. And so even if by this point, unions had been legal for about 50 years, right? Or the ability to unionize had been legal for about 50 years. Um, it was still not necessarily perfect, right? Um, it would get pretty good um, in like the 1930s, 40s and 50s, which is like the peak 
moment of trade union um, participation in North America. And then that would slowly be like dismantled um, over time. And I think union participation is at an all time low in North America now, right? Because God, it's yeah. been slowly dismantled and privatized, um, which is fun. Um, but yeah, as far as the Winnipeg is uh, general strike is concerned. So this happened for like a month and a half from May to June in 1919. And it was caused by basically the breakdown of negotiations um, between uh, the Winnipeg's building and metal trade unions and their bosses, right? They were unable to reach uh, any kind of satisfactory conclusion, right? Especially in a time when there was economic and social unrest, right? We're not far from the Great Depression, right? As it would happen, um, we're just yeah. coming out of World War I. Things are not like super wonderful as far as um, <laughs> as far as just general society. Oh, gee, it's a great war, man. <laughs> Truly a peak war. Everyone was happy with that one. <laughs> it's right there in the name. Chef's it's kiss great. of a war. <laughs> it was the war to end all wars for the next, I don't know, 10 years, 15 yeah, 20. Yeah, 1939 was when the, yeah. Um, but basically, the central issue was, um, you know, obviously maintaining uh, proper salaries, but also um, better demands to uh, collective bargaining, right? Which is not necessarily an immediate um, ability once you have a union. Right. Um, like unions offer certain protections, but not necessarily the immediate and automatic right to collective bargaining. And that was something that was central to uh, the issues that a lot of employees were asking for. That is a lovely position that you just took. It there, Mac. I cannot describe it to listeners, except that Mac now wants me to draw him like one of his French girls. <laughs> I'm recording in bed right now, okay? I'm making myself comfortable. <laughs> nice and cozy. But what's uh, what's interesting is that as uh, once these negotiations broke down, about 30,000 workers, which in any point in time is huge, but in 1919 was massive, right? Over 30,000 workers, which was the majority of Winnipeg's labor force, just quit work. Right. They factories closed, stores closed, mail delivery services stopped. Right. Uh, newspapers shut down and even telephones were not operational because at the time, of course, that was a whole thing that needed a workforce behind it. It was not automated like it is today. <laughs> um, but see, all of these things just actively stopped, literally bringing the city to a standstill. Right. Mm -hmm. So. 30,000 may seem like a small number in comparison to, for example, the strike that we're going through in Quebec right now, which has almost 500,000 people on strike. Um, but the the ability that these people had to actually bring actual operations just to a halt is demonstrative of their power and why they were able to like actually demand better conditions. Right, is because at least at the time they were so central. Um, and where it becomes um, a more general strike is that other, you know, public sector uh, or other employees, whether it's from the public sector or even in certain private sectors, also decided to go on strike in solidarity with the laborers that had originally uh, decided to strike. So it really set off like a whole motion of um, people who were disenfranchised or disenchanted or just generally pissed at the system that they feel was not giving them their fair share. And in 1919, like, it most certainly wasn't. I mean, fair, like the system very rarely does give you your fair share. That's the whole point of a trade union <laughs> is to at least get a little bit back, right? Um, but yeah, basically this, 
the the umbrella organization for the trade unions in the city, which is known as the Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council, um, actually voted on whether or not to go on a general sympathy strike, right, um, of its members for those of you who for those of them who weren't officially on strike uh, or officially negotiating, um, and it was crushingly in favor. Like eleven thousand members voted for and only five hundred against. Which just goes to show just how much people were on board with this. Now, Patrick, can you break down the different types of strikes for us, please? Since you're you very mean? much involved. Well, you say general sympathy strike. What does that mean? What does it mean to have an indefinite strike? What does it mean to have like definite, like break down these terms for us? So just so we understand the magnitude of this event. That's Yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. So a strike generally happens not for me when... i know all these things of course this is for our listeners yes of course for uh what was the what was the joke for, for... my mother lee's <laughs> so a strike happens uh, generally uh when someone stops a uh, a job that they're uh, paid to do and obviously when you stop doing that job you do not get paid for it so you're foregoing a salary in order to show uh, that you are indispensable for that particular job, mm -hmm. right? Um, so if I take my particular um, my particular case right now as a teacher, uh, we decided to go on strike in order to show just how um, necessary teachers are to the proper functioning of a society. And mm -hmm. using that demonstration, right, of importance, in order to garner better conditions or better pay or better um, workload, better respect, whatever it may be, right? Um, and obviously negotiations can happen uh, with different people. I'm negotiating with the government currently or my union is right? because I'm a public service employee. However, this can happen on a private level as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or even, um, it can even happen outside of labor concerns, right? Um, for example, um, historically speaking, there were hunger strikes, right? By either prisoners who wanted to manifest against or conditions, right? Uh, so they for uh, they for forwent, they decided to forego food um, uh, as a way to cause disruptions. That would be one of them. Um, now, to answer your other question, so the um, the metal and building trades of Winnipeg were the ones who went on strike because they were the ones negotiating, right? So they were the ones who wanted to exert a pressure tactic, um, say, okay, well, we're not going to continue building and we're not going to continue doing our trade as long as you don't respect our demands, right? Or at least meet us halfway or at some point. Um, the sympathy strike was by people who were not directly involved in those negotiations, um, but who said, okay, even though we're not involved in those negotiations, we're also going to stop work as a show of solidarity with fellow workers or fellow employees, fellow whatever, um, mm -hmm. and thus add our hat to the ring and you know ratchet up the pressure and hopefully get better, um, get a rep better representation or better recognition for your demands. I don't know. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Would you add just... anything to um, that? So did you describe the difference between like an indefinite strike or like how strikes can sort of be timed out or? Go for it. Yeah, no. So, so as Patrick said, an indefinite strike is a strike without end, essentially. So if I'm getting this right, you're basically saying we're going to start striking. And we're not going to stop until our demands are met. Now, mm -hmm. that's sort of almost like a last resort you don't want to because then you're in a standoff really before that like so what patrick and other people did in quebec recently is they decided to do a week long i would think sort of a start wasn't it or like that was sort of the idea was so you do a week of striking you show the other side what's going to happen and then they sort of say okay okay let's let's put these things together and see what's going to happen or you can have sort of like, and again, timing wise, indefinite basically just means we're going to keep doing this until we can't anymore, until you give it. And then it's just a big game of chicken. Basically. And so to freeze an example, the writer's strike that happened yes. in Hollywood, 
indefinite strike. They went on for as long as they needed to. Absolutely. And they won in the end, didn't they? Yes, they got all of their demands, uh, or most of them, yeah. I think, um, respected. And like you said, nobody wants to go on indefinite strike. Like you can easily make, like you see that a lot of, especially on conservative criticism being like, well, these people just don't want to work. And it's like, no, nobody wants to do that because then we don't get paid. We don't, it's hard on people to actually be well, on the also, picket line. Right? And it's not just, it's also like, you like your job. Yeah. Like it's fine to, to like you, your work. No, but Patrick, like you like your job, right? As a sage yeah. professor right now. The writers like writing and creating shows and stuff. They're not striking. It's because they cannot do that job currently. That's why people strike, because they can't do the thing they actually enjoy doing. Yeah, that's the thing. You enjoy doing it. You should be you should be doing it for free. And give me if my you enjoy food, doing it. Provide me everything I need to live and I'll do gladly do it for free. But then that would be socialism. <laughs> Damn communists. <laughs> No, but the, that that's a good point. And like in in our case, I don't know how it went with the with the writer no. strike. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, like if they went immediately to unlimited strike or if it was progressive, I really have no idea. No. Um, and now now going back to this one, obviously, yeah. industry striking like for steel, or whatever that's different. Like yeah, maybe people don't want to be steel workers, but these are also people, they like the idea of work. They like the idea of putting in a hard day's work. Like this is something intrinsically that humans have been culturally made to enjoy is just feeling like you've accomplished something. So people going on strike is like, it's not just, Oh, we don't want to work. It's the fact that we need to be able to live while we are working. Absolutely. Or be able to adapt our working conditions to changing environments, like with the yeah. writers, right? Uh, integrating um, artificial intelligence policies. Or keeping the writers' room into... alive. The very, like, because that was a big point for them. That was a big, big uh, point in the strike was the writers' room. Absolutely. And for those of you who, uh, for, for people who don't even, uh, like, the, the one that uh, you often hear as a criticism over and over again is like, well, it costs a lot of money to do that. Yeah, but it depends also who you want to... The money is being made anyway. It depends who you mm -hmm. want it to go to, mm -hmm. right? Do, do you want it to go to the people who actually produce the thing and do the thing? Or do you want it to, to go to just some person who's idly sitting by and receiving all the benefits, mm -hmm. right? And... That doesn't apply to necessarily all situations at all times, but in the case of the industrial workers, that's certainly um, one of their major points as well, is to say, no, we literally are the ones who are building this stuff, right? <laughs> like, the, the, the reason why this whole infrastructure exists in the first place is not because just someone Burn has a, a fact piece of checker. paper. Right, exactly. Like that's just, that is a part of it, but it wouldn't exist without us. Right. And we deserve more recognition for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. Um, I should have looked Living it up. Wages. I don't know what the actual, but that's the thing. I don't know what the actual wages were that they received at the time. Um, minimum wage was not a thing at this time. I know that. Um, but I don't know what their average salary would have been. I, are you looking it up right now? Is that it? No, no, no. Sorry. I was looking okay. something else popped up. <laughs> right um but yeah we can maybe uh look it up but um yeah the the thing i wanted to mention before moving on to like the reaction uh the official reaction of the strike was just to again mention here so the very first uh strike day actually overwhelmed most people in winnipeg as to its magnitude because nice. a lot of people who were striking were not actually members of the union. They were just people who were actively supporting these people, right? Just people coming in from the streets, right? They had mm -hmm. little stake in the immediate issues that were behind the strike, and they had no union to protect them uh, from reprisals, right? But they were still there anyway, which I, again, think just is a really good indicator of the general sentiment behind what was mm -hmm. happening at this time. Um. So I'm just going to look up here. Okay. 
Okay, good. Winnipeg strikes. There's actually a CBC article right there, right? To, to give a good example of why people were on strike as well, according to the CBC article, um, the cost of living between 1913 and 1919, so during the war years, had gone up 75%. Right? Mm -hmm. The average pay for a family, because mostly it would have been men working at this time, was $900 per year. So oh. not great. No, not fun. Mm -hmm. Yet it was estimated that $1,500 was needed to feed a family by 1919. So there mm -hmm. you have it. Again, <laughs> almost sorry to keep harping on the modern day. People wonder why our generation doesn't want to have kids. Yeah. Like, now we have the added benefit of climate change. <laughs> like, the literal oh incoming apocalypse. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I'm not going to sleep tonight. Yeah, exactly. But that that's a, I think, a, I, I hadn't found the statistic before, but yeah, it's a good way of, um, of indicating this. Yeah. But um, All right. Mac, mm -hmm. as far as like reactions were concerned, you had briefly alluded to this before, but how do you think the general public, uh, the, the people in charge, the bosses, the government, how do you think they oh reacted to just people stopping working? Do you think they were bringing out roses and flowers in the red carpet? It's wild. Like, as soon as they, like, it's wild to me how many business magnets who have to plan ahead can be so short-sighted. It is a genuinely wild thing to me <laughs> that they can't consider the long-term ramifications on their workforce. Say more about that. What do you mean? Like, because obviously they started striking. So after one day, they probably got pissy. Like, how dare these people demand more, expect more of their life, even though we tell them all the time, hey, you should expect more from yourself. And it's like, oh, you just pay them a bit more short term. So yeah, short term, your profits probably take a bit of a dip. But then long term, you have happier workers who can do more and are probably happier to stay behind at work. And then you get better profits in the long term. It's wild. It's a brand new concept concept perhaps one that was it's called actually respect. determined right around this time people knew this shit yeah <laughs> people have known this shit for years that's how kings stayed in power yeah absolute happy kingdom yeah. uh, but bread no. and bread and games is the expression treat yeah. your people correctly and you'll actually they will be not able to like like the natural inclination of your average person is not to overthrow their government, their business or whatever. Most people just want to be left the fuck alone and be able to live their lives. Even in this case, that's not their, they weren't, uh, they were not wanting to, to just destroy the government of Winnipeg or of Canada. No, they just they wanted to live. Yeah. They literally, <laughs> they probably didn't even want to destroy their businesses. They just wanted to live. No. What a shocking <laughs> concept. How dare they? How dare they? How dare they breathe? Can we I'm, charge them for breathing? I'm sure someone's thought of that before. That's going to be our future after climate change. Oxygen tax. Those already exist, don't they? In China. Don't yeah. you see that in China? Uh, not in China necessarily, but in like Asia and highly polluted countries where it's like yep. they have oxygen in bottles that are... Yeah. They also... Yeah. It's, it's not yeah. great. But we're being... Like for listeners who might think that we're being a bit like facetious right now and sarcastic this is literally just almost what how people reacted right it's yeah. like well, we're we're paying them something why would they why would they revolt against this <laughs> like why would this be uh something that happens how un uh, what's the word i'm looking for how um oh i'm looking i want for people to think about it think of it this way at home yeah. So let's say you go to the grocery store, right? And usually you buy your bread and it's about how much a loaf of bread. How much would you say a loaf of bread is these days? Five bucks, ten, five, six bucks. bucks. So let's say it's five bucks. Let's 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 do some pre-inflation prices. And then let's say you go back like a week later, or whatever, and you figure out you learn now that the bread is ten bucks. You'd be a little pissed, right? Almost like it's actually what's happening. Yeah. And so imagine now it's not just the bread that's doubled in price. Everything is doubled in price and suddenly you can't buy anything. What is left to you to do? Like genuine question. Exactly. Ask yourself, what is, what are you supposed to do at that point? 
when you can't especially, afford anything. Especially that one of the pull advantages yourself, of pull your bootstraps harder, like exactly. But that's the thing is like one of the things that you start to see more and more is because of the advent of mass media, like newspapers and uh, radio even starts, right? Not, uh, it's not like widespread, but it's starting right around this time uh, is you start to see that people are increasingly aware that there are these disparities that are happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this has been happening for a long time. Um, like people, there's a reason why you know, people were having revolts for centuries. Like people were aware of these things, but more and more people were shown these things despite the fact that rhetorically speaking we were supposedly living in right a democratic system in which everyone had the same opportunities where you're like does the factory worker in 1919 who can barely feed his family Reed. have the same opportunities as the magnate who owns the factory yes he has a union that's great but the union has to they serve don't have thousands the same of factory workers exactly um it's terrible yeah we we, uh, we otherwise we'd be here all day i think we should probably keep moving it's true <laughs> we'd just be talking but, about striking so one of the ways that you can we can kind of understand why uh like officially or official policy would have been more antagonistic towards the strike mac what happened in europe two years before the winnipeg strike so we're in 1919 in winnipeg when this happens what happened in 1917? That was like a major event that started perhaps with people that were open to unions and striking and revolutionary thought. Uh, comrade, comrade, is it time? <laughs> Do we get to talk about the, 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 the big daddy of them all? Big baddie being? The Russian Revolution? Is it time? Hell yeah. Do I get it to is throw, time. throw the czar? Can we can we yes. can we talk about Anastasia? Right. <laughs> we, we can maybe talk about. I'm planning next episode to be on the Communist Party of Canada, which emerged out of this thing. We can talk about it then if you want, but we can talk about it now. If you I whatever, say so what you will about the right Communist now, Party. Okay. <laughs> The Bolshevik Revolution happened in 1917. Oh, something's revolutionizing my Bolsheviks. <laughs> a certain, you know, Vladimir Lenin overthrows the fucking government. Thank you, Lenin. Has, has Europe crap itself, right? Um, because the red suddenly... scare begins, baby. Check your closet. Trotsky's going to come out with an ice pick. That's the thing. Is like. Very good joke, by the way. <laughs> There's layers to my comedy. But, right, I, I think people associate Red Scare with, like, the 50s, right? The McCarthy era. Oh, Red but Scare's been it's around important. for decades. It was around for a long time. And, like, the initial Russian Revolution very much kicked it off, right? Well, we just call it the 50s because we like to put a face to the scapegoating. But to be honest, people have been red scaring since the goddamn since as soon as factories went up, people were causing a red scare. The second Karl Marx came out with his little book. Yeah, there's a reason why he lived in exile. He never lived in the same place. No, at, like at the same time or for very, very long, I should say. Like he he was pushed around by a lot of people. And look, I, I'm anticipating a wave of comments because as soon as we get political on the show we we do i know mostly from my mother union. like whatever i know what happened in the soviet union what became of it that doesn't matter right now <laughs> right like and there's a bunch of reasons why it became what it became that's that's not what we're talking about now the point being that regardless of what it became the idea behind the revolution inspired both people abroad to take up their own mantle of revolutionary praxis and governments to react against such things, even in disproportionate matter, right? Yes. That is the fact of like what happened here. And this is what's happening in this very particular moment in Winnipeg as well. I don't know. Did you have anything to add on that? I'm just kind of like getting ahead of any of that criticism. 
No, and like again, as you sort of saying, we're not. We joke, and obviously, yes, we are a left-leaning podcast. There's no sure. doubt about that. But at the end of the day, like, it's not me to tell you who you think you are or think you're voting. The important thing to understand is that, like, this moment had an impact on a lot of people. And a lot of people took up some kind of cause or another to basically to say, workers' rights. The same way people take up the cause at one point to say civil rights, women's rights, and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Look, nobody in Winnipeg wanted to, as far as I know, like there there were obviously, you know, lefties uh, in Winnipeg. Otherwise, they wouldn't have necessarily Dirty joined a labor union. Lefties, right? But um, again, Such nobody, assholes. as far as I know, were was planning on overthrowing. Uh, who would have been at the time would have been uh, it would have been the Borden government, right? Nobody mm-hmm. was planning that, right? But the reaction against them was very much as if they were, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, towards the end of the strike on June, what was during a silent parade, right? Most of the actual strike days were very silent and calm. Like there was no, it was not like smashing windows and throwing bombs, Right. There were oh, altercations, yeah. but like it was often not started by the actual strikers, right? Who were oh, mostly gee. just kind of like picketing. I wonder who started all the problems. Well, let me tell you about a little force that's called the specials. So special all this right. this oh yeah. This strike in Winnipeg was so popular that even the cops got on board with it. <laughs> <laughs> because this was at a time when they didn't have a union either. So even they were like, oh, this could be kind of cool to get on. We we are working men as well. We should maybe get in on this right stuff. And Montrealers have regretted it ever since. <laughs> it's always a good um, time when I can make Patrick move away from his mic to laugh with one of my jokes, folks. <laughs> It's the little things that make the chemicals in my brain go happy. Right. So basically the cops, they refused uh, in Winnipeg to sign a no strike pledge. They were like, we're not technically on strike, but we're not discounting. We're not mm-hmm. immediately discounting the possibility that we won't. Right. And the city in response fired all of them because again, they don't have a union to protect them from that. Right. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something. No, no, I just I love that so much. Yeah, just like, which it's almost like by the way, you, serve a purpose. Yeah. By the way, if you think that's something that only could happen a hundred years ago, it literally happened forty years ago when Ronald Reagan fired every single um, striking airplane worker um, in the eighties um, at that at a particular airport. So that's fun. Mm. Um, so Reagan. instead. Uh, from the city who did not want to have to deal with a maybe striking police force hired 1800 uh, anti-strike specials so specifically people who were anti-strike and who had no qualms with beating up strikers so what would happen if you put a specially designed task force of 1800 armed men um, and the RCMP against peaceful protesters well on june 21st of 1918 Mm -hmm. uh, 1919 you get what's called bloody saturday right where the rcmp straight up attacked a silent parade of uh returning soldiers in this case who were attempting to demonstrate they were just there to demonstrate their support for the strike and the mounties actually fired into the crowd right uh once it started to get uh, a bit too uh, rowdy. Thanks and for being the left. worst RCMP. Just you failed at the bare minimum of serve and protect. <laughs> Thanks for just being the worst. Ah, uh, um, and this is pretty much at the point where it gets where it all falls apart, right? It had had some momentum, but this is where the strike falls apart because, um. Yeah, because you know, now people are like, oh, we're going to get shot. We're going to die. Exactly. Right. But not just that. Like, people actually died. I think two people were killed on that particular Saturday, mm-hmm. and many others were wounded. Um, but also, 
the specials started pursuing people through downtown Winnipeg, beating people up, arresting them, right? Um, but also papers that were specifically led by the strikers or oh, the no. Western Labor <laughs> News, they were starting to be arrested, uh, shut down, and their editors arrested. Like, it's a straight-up attack on free speech. In this and that's the death of a democracy right there. Thanks. Nice reference. Not with a with uproarious clapping, whatever the line is. From that stupid I just mean there. in general, like, it's a legitimately disturbing thing to see is just people shutting down the newspaper. Yeah, exactly. Um, and at the time, right, like, people will make parallels today with like, oh, canceling people. It's like censorship. It's like, it's not the same thing at mm -hmm. all. These were often people's livelihoods. These was, uh, this was often the only way that people got information about anything that wasn't government mandated. So this was important to have, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, a few days after these papers and people were arrested or shut down, the strike was called off. Right. And thus ended what was, up until that point, I think the biggest strike in Canadian history. Um, yeah, pretty much as a result of this strike, you, like I said, see the rise of other lefty movements. Uh, like I was saying, the Communist Party of Canada would emerge specifically out of this particular, um, mm -hmm. this particular event and the reaction against it, right? It kind of coalesced people and saying like no okay this shows that this type of movement and idea is important to have mm -hmm. um but unfortunately what you also saw is that in other cities in canada there was a kind of preemptive strike against anything like that uh from mm -hmm. the uh from the side of the authorities um so for example the Immigration Act in Canada was altered to allow the deportation of any strike leaders, right? So your union's not going to do much in the face of that law, mm -hmm. right? um, as, as well as the legal definition of what was considered treason or sedition was extended to include striking, mm -hmm. right, or strike leaders. So again, you can't do much aside from play so ball. what did the, the strikes system. actually establish? Like, did the strikes accomplish what they set out to do? No. Okay. As far as I know, they did not. Um, I'll look it up just to make sure, but I didn't write it down in the notes, so it probably... So we keep moving, because we still have a book to get to. <laughs> and we've already been speaking for, like, an hour. Yeah, we still have... <laughs> this might need, to, might need to be a two-parter. I mean, yeah, we can get into it right away. KCDI we'll soon, see. though, Patrick really likes striking. Oh, I love it. It's just he just hates the concept day, of working. <laughs> so Patrick looks up the diehard accomplishments. I'm going to get us into what we're actually supposed to be talking about today. So tell us the about the work Michael of Michael Andachi. Yes. So Michael Andachi is another author that makes the case for the fact that all of Canada's best writers and most well-known authors from the past century are the opposite of what we or the opposite of what we show the world. Because all of Canada's best and most well-known authors are people of color or women or something along those lines. It's hilarious how much we will push the white man narrative when we can literally just bank on the rest of our authors that we have that are even better. But Do hey, you mean you don't want, insert bland white dude, to be the center of the canon? The only white dude I accept in my Canadian canon is Thomas Finley. Timothy, but okay. Timothy Finley. Sure. That's literally how little I care right now. <laughs> Thomas, Timmy, Jimmy, pfft, all a bunch of jackoffs. So, Michael Andachi, he was a big writer in the 70s and 80s. He's still alive, still writing today, but he was probably the biggest at that time in those movements. And so he is most well known for the postmodern fictional narratives. And funny enough, his books, despite being a Canadian author, he is not the most well connected as far as Canadian identity or writing goes. A lot of his stories actually sort of take place in a sort of transitional liminal space or in the US, England. The main book that takes place in Canada is the one we're going to be talking about today, In the Skin of a Lion. So he was born in Sri Lanka. 
or what was what would soon become Sri Lanka, and at the time was known as Ceylon. And but then with his mother, he moved to England in 1954, and then he moved to Canada in 1962. And fun fact: when he came to Canada, he lived in Montreal. And he went to a high school called Bishop's College School. And for those listeners that are aware, that's where I went to high school. We have the Michael and Dachi Award. We have like trips that we do based around Michael and Dachi. I'm pretty sure my sister won the award, but I didn't. And that's okay. I'm not bitter. The fun little connection. Are we going to confirm fact. whether your sister did it or not? No. No, I'm fucking kidding. My mother will <laughs> confirm with me after she hears the episode. It's fine. Anyway, so Michael and Dachi is like, he is the writer's writer for postmodernism. And so we've talked about postmodernism a little bit before. And essentially, postmodernism as a movement. So modernism as a movement took place like early 20th century, late 19th century, basically in response to factory working and horrible living conditions and everybody realizing that life's kind of shit. Postmodernism, which comes after that, basically says, what is life anyway? What is existence? Or what is writing? If you follow all of these questions, or if you follow, I think, Frederick Jameson's very good analysis of postmodernism. Postmodernism is another white man, probably. Yes. He's an American literary critic. But we um, don't accept the opinion of white men here. He has a really good interpretation of postmodernism as a cultural phenomenon that says that it's a rehashing of past things in a kind of pastiche way. Yeah. Um, and a Think of it this way. We're almost in our own kind of postmodernism with oh, a yeah. lot of media right now. Oh, yeah. If you look at video games, there's a lot of postmodern video games that basically make you question what the fuck is a video game? Yes. Many superhero much a lot of superhero content is about taking the piss out of superhero content every goddamn disney movie these days is about making fun of disney movies every little snide joke in moana that makes you want to put a bullet in your brain that's part of postmodernism except it is a horrible 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 version of postmodernism it is the corporate capitalism version of postmodernism that's the thing like the, the, you can also look to um, British cultural critic um, Mark Fisher had a really good analysis. Like in the 21st century, what is the culture of the 21st century? And to him, there's none. Not to say that we don't have culture, but it's always referential back to something else Our or culture a parody of something. Exactly. Which is not culture. <laughs> um, by the way, to answer your question, no, the Winnipeg General Strike did not accomplish anything, although it did eventually help galvanize uh, the working class of Canada. I uh, love it. So back to yeah. Michael and Dodge and postmodernism. A very famous picture of postmodernism, to give you an example, is the picture of a pipe. And written underneath is the words, this is not a pipe. Yes. And the idea is essentially, it's not a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe. But doesn't a painting of a pipe imply that it's a pipe on the painting? And then you're stuck in this sort of loop and you want to sort of curl yourself into a ball and die. So basically, stick away from postmodernism. Stick stick to basic ideas. Keep your simple folks. Okay. Postmodernism for academic we... elites. Now, back to Michael and why... and academic elite. So we study postmodernism because it really, it, it really forces you to get very self-reflective. And it really helps us self-reflect and get critical about ideas about culture, identity, nationality, life, existence. What is the point of all this? Modernism basically gave us the problem and tried to force us into a solution. Postmodernism takes the solution and works backwards. We're trying, to re- yeah. we're trying to re-look at what the problem actually is. Yes. And you can put it in a really interesting way to bring it directly to the book. Right? The book is not... Uh, we'll come to what the book is about, but the book is not structured in a conventional way. No, right? this it's book like a is, weird. Yeah, this book, like uh, other works of Michael and Dachi, is a little bit. It's not because yeah. the people might hear how we're going to talk about the book, and their the immediate thought might be to jump to something like sun, sh- sunshine sketches of a small town, but that doesn't exactly fit the bill of what this is either. This is almost more. It's 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 too interconnected to not to be like Sunshine Sketches. Sunshine Sketches is exactly, yeah, exactly. that sketches that technically take place in the same 
town, but are not connected. Whereas this is a connected story. You just don't see it until the very end when all of these connections take place. It does feel like a puzzle more than anything. Now back to Michael and Dachi for a second. We're going to jump around a little bit, just like a postmodernist podcast. Hey, Patrick, what's a podcast? I don't know. Back to Michael and Dachi. <laughs> So we're looking at Michael and Dachi, and he's had a lot of great sort of works and books that come out over years. Things like the Billy the Kid, which is the work, the collected works of Billy the Kid that I read for class. There's Dainty Monster, Secular Love, The Cinnamon Peeler. His most famous one is probably The English Patient, which became a film. Probably. Yeah. It is most certainly. Yeah. <laughs> didn't it be, Everyone didn't knows it become, The English Patient. Didn't it become an award-winning film? I think it won the Oscar, didn't it? There you go. He's an Oscar winner, baby. And if that's not a mark of prestige, I don't know what is in our modern 21st century society where our celebrities are politicians and our politicians are celebrities. So back to Michael and Dachi. <laughs> in case people Love didn't know, rant. I'm going crazy. You're going fucking bananas on this and it's great. <laughs> back to Just Michael and Dachi. The, He's also... the mental breakdown that you're having is phenomenal. As soon as we get into post, like... I am a man who I match the tone of the thing I am in. And as soon as we jump okay. into anything postmodern, my brain just spaghettis. Like okay. and before so before people turn back to the Michael podcast and, off. Back Wait. to Michael and Dachi. I just want to because I, I really don't want to hammer home. This is an incredible writer. Like yes. this is a like once in a generation kind of guy, incredibly talented. We are unbelievably lucky that he considers himself Canadian of all things. Oh yeah. Because his body of work, the amount of prizes that he won, he won Giller Prize, Booker Prize. He was up for the Ritz Hemingway Prize, which is like unbelievably oh, high shit. up. Yeah. For oh, those yeah. of you who might recognize the name Hemingway, yes, that Hemingway as in one of the most acclaimed writers <laughs> of all time. And yep. he shared that award with Toni Morrison, another one of the most acclaimed writers of all time. But back to Michael Andachi. See, what his strength really lied in was he was very good at these sort of character breakdowns and these sort of mm -hmm. profiled dissections. He did it much better than I'm doing for Michael Andachi right now. I love that I have to say his name every time. <laughs> the full thing. <laughs> if he had a middle name, I'd say it too. But back to Michael Andachi, his the the significance of his work cannot be overstated, as it has it, pl it has played an exceptional role in like even just shaping postmodernism today. I would say so. Yeah. Like he he isn't just a Canadian postmodern writer; he is a postmodern writer for everybody. Yeah. He is Absolutely. affluent in the same way that Margaret Atwood was affluent for the feminist dystopian literature genre. I would say so. Yeah. I feel like, I feel on Dachi is perhaps more versatile as yes. a writer. Yes. Yeah. No, no shade against Atwood, but I feel Atwood, like Atwood as a typical woman matter. found one subject matter and she just keeps wow. hammering it and nagging and nagging. No, I'm kidding. Margaret Atwood, as we all know, is actually a horrible person. Horrible <laughs> a horrible person who just has horrible tweets that needs to be canceled. But back to Michael and Dachi. He doesn't need to be canceled just yet. We haven't found anything. He's just 80 years old. He's just chilling in London right now, trying to keep his writing going. And you know what? If you're a famous Canadian who doesn't live in your own country anymore, that's the most Canadian thing you can do. Especially go back to Britain. Yes, but back to Michael and Dachi and talking about In the Skin of a Lion. Patrick, take it away before I lose all our listeners. I'm going to have such a hell of a time editing this, and I'm hissed. Maybe I'm not going to edit any of it. <laughs> Just leave it in. <laughs> Just leave it in. <laughs> leave it um, in before I bring it back to Michael and Dachi again. Okay, so to, to, to put this in a concise way, In the Skin of a Lion, is kind of interesting because it touches on many of the points that you were talking about technically as a story it's about a a particular um a particular worker right a working class man called patrick right patrick lewis and uh, 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 working man patrick striking you this episode was made for you but anyway it's, back it's to michael andachi <laughs> but it's ostensibly about him, but contrary to what Mac was saying, which where a lot of 
Andachi's books are character studies. This one kind of breaks with that and almost immediately focuses on the more general aspects of yeah, life I'm, in Toronto in the 1920s. I actually think right. it still is a character study. It's just, it's not a character study of somebody specific. It's a character study of the common person. Like this is very That's much it. a breakdown of like the industrial commoner. Right. And which is kind of cool. Like, yeah. because there is no main character, technically, right? Like Patrick is just maybe... sort of, Patrick is our vehicle more than anything. Yes. In the exactly. same way, Patrick is our vehicle through this podcast. Postmodernism. Ah. Well, like, so that's the thing is that you technically have a main character or a vehicle, but the breakdown of that and having them, having the main character or uh, character study be the working class or this concept makes it or pushes it towards the postmodern um, rather than the modern. Um, and to add on to Mac and to give a concrete example in, in the skin of a lion, Andachi is trying to capture the essence of modernism, right? By writing a novel about modernism and its essence, right? Which makes, so it that postmodern. Well, makes it postmodern. Exactly. This is modernism, he says, pointing to a novel. And then you realize, no, it is not modernism. It is a novel about modernism. But that doesn't that make it modernism? No. But back to Michael and, Andachi. Yes, back to him, because it doesn't make it modernism because he's aware of the fact that it is a text, right? And he's actively questioning the role of history in shaping mm -hmm. and how uh, like th that history is shaped, like historical fiction is very often postmodern because it points to its own constructions, which is what In the Skin of a Lion is doing. Right? Yeah. Um, it's one of those things that... where it's not a true story, but it's a very real story. And yeah, it uses exactly. modernism to tell that tale. Right. Exactly. Um, and there's a point... Um, there's a point at the start where I think he mentioned something uh, about... Like, or at least that points towards like the constructions. Oh yeah, right there in the acknowledgments, right at the beginning. He kind of uh, has yes. this tongue in cheek. Gilgamesh. Moment. Well, not just Gilgamesh. Right, right before Gilgamesh. Oh. This is a work of fiction, and certain liberties have been taken at times with, uh, have been at, at at times been taken with some dates and locales, but it's almost all fiction. Patrick Lewis is a person never existed. Like, there's one true element and the rest is like archives that he reconstructed mm -hmm. right like so he's simultaneously pointing to the fact that he's basing himself on something real but it's almost all fiction the fiction becomes the reality that he's representing right Which and that's honestly really cool uh, that's one of my favorite parts yes. well uh, yes. i love how he also he gives a so the, for, if you look into the first sort of page of the book you mm -hmm. have your table of contents. And then underneath, you have a quote from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yes. And so for my mother, Elise, the Epic of Gilgamesh is essentially the first story ever told that we know of. Like, it's the first written down story. Yeah. Historically speaking, all narratives start with the Epic of Gilgamesh, and they continue yes. onwards. And then right after that, he has a quote from John Berger, Berger Ber mm -hmm. who is a contemporary of his. Yes. He, I don't so think Berger we, is dead now. Not he's sure. dead now, but not at the time. Yes. Actually, he's still alive. Oh, no, he died 2017. Okay. Anyway. But Bert, he was a contemporary of his. And so we essentially have this... Michael Andachi is basically sort of positioning a timeline for us right now. And he's basically just sort of putting his book there. And in the, in the discussion, I just... I love the use of the Epic of Gilgamesh of all things as well. Yeah. Uh, why do you think that's important? The Epic of Gilgamesh is important because it is the hero's journey of hero's journeys. And so Patrick Lewis positioned both as the modern hero with John Berger and Gilgamesh at his side. They're walking yeah. as a trio away from the pub. You know, Gilgamesh is swaying side to side because he drank too much. Berger's the sober one taking everybody home. And Patrick Lewis is the one that's going to try and get everybody to do something stupid. It is kind of interesting. Again, it fits in with uh, Andachi's uh, deconstruction, 
of the hero, mm -hmm. right? Because Gilgamesh is the quintessential hero. He's he's important and powerful in the story because he's the hero. Yeah. He's not the hero. He's loud, he's brash, and arrogant. And yeah. Right. He doesn't need to justify himself. He's just the hero because he is, right? Simply is like Gilgamesh. There, there's no character arc in Gilgamesh. He's just cool. <laughs> right. He's just Whereas, badass. Yeah, he's like, just if you ever have a free weekend, read the epic of Gilgamesh. Right. And Patrick Lewis does not fit the bill. He comes from a poor working class family, no. and he's also poor in working class. And he still manages to be integral to this modern narrative and modern epic that Andachi situates as the construction of Toronto. The epic is the underlying situation that builds this Gilgameshian, you know, landscape, right? That is the modern Toronto world, right? Um, mm -hmm. And Patrick Lewis allows that to happen as the technical hero, Right, but he doesn't have any of the qualities of a hero. Mm -hmm. um, or, but it's not that he doesn't have any of the qualities of a hero. He's a nice guy. He's not a piece of shit. But he doesn't Who, Patrick? embody what you typically imagine. Yeah, you are as. a bit of a piece of shit, Patrick, but that's okay. We still love you anyway. And I do like the John Berger quote, because this is Zondachi pointing to like the limits of of structuralism, right? Of him being well, like, and it's also that's Berger. Because that's just as important. Gilgamesh gave us the structure of all heroes' journeys and stories. And now immediately afterwards, immediately as he has put forth like the template by which we all follow, he's immediately saying, hey, this is limited. Yeah. Like the man is basically right. saying, I'm going to create a new story. Which there will be a new Andachi. genre and it will be called right. The Skin of a Lion. Which Nintendo does. Like, not going to lie, Andachi as you were saying, pretty much central to postmodern novel Movement. and postmodern writing. Good on him. Um, all right. As we usually do, like, were there any particular passages that you wanted to point to in the book that you thought were kind of cool or interesting? Because we can't talk about everything. Love the very happened. first page. Okay. Go like the it. little prologue section. Mm -hmm. This is a story of a young girl gathers in a car during the early hours of morning. She listens and asks questions as the vehicle travels through darkness. Outside, the countryside is unbetrayed. The man who is driving could say, in that field is castle, and it would be possible for her to believe him. She listens to the man as he picks up and brings together various corners of the story, attempting to carry it all in his arms. As he is tired, sometimes as elliptical as his concentration on the road, as time overexcited. Do you see? He turns to her in the faint light of the speedometer. Driving the four hours to Marmora under six hour, stars in the moon, she stays awake to keep him company. I love that. Just because, like, the immediate positioning of story within a story, which, yes. again, very common storytelling device. Because it basically yeah. gives Andachi a way to basically say, this is all fake, this is all fiction, this is, like, third-hand account. Fuck you, no, none of this is real. I'm going to say whatever I want right now. Second of all... Yeah. It really positions the idea of, again, like, not really a main character. Because this guy is just sort of telling a story. This is the story a young girl gathers, right? So, like, yeah. the very well, first again, person like, you meet is not even yeah. the main character. It's a young girl that he's talking yeah. to. And it's just this bus driver or whatever is just kind of, like, pulling in, like, random bits of a story that's getting cobbled together into a main story. It's hilarious. I love it. It's such Which a Which is kind setup. of what the show... Which is kind of what the book is. Just like yeah. a collection of stories that are loosely connected through Toronto. Well, it's also, it's a great pastiche of modernism as well. Because a lot of modernist stories start this exact same way. Except in those stories, it's a bunch of old white dudes sitting in a parlor together having a drink. In, in Ndachi's version, it said it's an old man and a young girl on a bus in a city. And they have no yeah. idea what, like, outside the countryside is unbetrayed. Everything is dark and unseen. Yeah. Coming back to that, like, reinterpretation of modernism, that's one of the notes that I had here is, like, often in modernism, the main character is, like, a kind of exile. I'll take mm -hmm. the classic example of Ulysses, right? Because... Uh, Woo, James Joyce, James baby! Joyce. Like, he's an easy example. Michael but, Andachi of modernism. Right. Like, that's very postmodern of you. 
<laughs> but back to Michael and Bocci. But like in Ulysses, the main character, Stephen Daedalus, is an exile, right? Uh, He's Daedalus an outsider. Uh, not Stephen Daedalus um, or Harold Bloom. Sorry. Daedalus is so, Orchard of the Artist. But regardless, he's an outsider. He doesn't necessarily feel like he belongs either to the world around him and certainly not to his family and friends, right? I love how you're pulling um, on Ulysses as modernism when Ulysses itself is basically a pastiche of classism in the classics. Which It's like poetry. Uh, it rhymes. It doesn't matter, Mac. It's all bullshit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a postmodern take for you, baby. Back to James Joyce. No, back to Michael Ondaatje. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> listeners. I'm truly sorry for this episode. We're not. This it's is insane wreck. that I love it. But he basically repositions this exile as the immigrant worker or as the mm. modern proletarian, right? Um, and he does that through Patrick Lewis, who's the son of an immigrant worker. And so, and throughout, you see a bunch of vignettes on immigrant workers who feel both the exile of their own home, right, coming to Canada, and the exile of their labor, right, the alienation uh, from their labor power, and so on. So you get this double exile that's happening, um, which reflects, but also pushes beyond the modernist take. Um, and I feel like this comes up. This is exactly in the middle of the book. Um, yeah, this is in the section called Palace of Purification, which... Um, you can take my name. Palace of Purification. But it's it's really interesting. I'm not necessarily... I'll try to find a particular passage to read. Um, but what's interesting about this particular passage is that it reflects a bit what we were talking about with the um, Winnipeg strike. Because what you get in this particular section is a meeting of workers, right? Um, illegal, right? They meet at their workplace, which in this case is a tunnel that they're building under Toronto, a water work. Mm -hmm. And because they all know of this place, they meet there in order to gather and talk about the issues that concern them. But so what's really interesting, um, and I'll try to find the section here because I, for some reason, did not write it down, but I'll describe it. What basically happens in this section is that you get speeches that are given in all kinds of languages because all of these workers are from different countries. Uh, but despite this linguistic barrier that's happening, there is that commonality that makes it so that everyone understands what's going on, right? This commonality of exile both in the modernist and postmodernist sense, is bringing all of these laborers together um, that in a way that comes across, right? Linguistic and divides. To and hop I think on that's to your really... point and to sort of pull it back to myself right now, because this is not a podcast. This is two dudes talking about literature. Mm -hmm. So if we yeah. go to page 44, yes. I think sort of like this building of this idea and this recognition of brotherhood, it talks about the crew of the men in the tunnel. Mm. And the men remove their shirts and hammer them into the hard walls with spikes. Patrick can recognize other tunnelers on the way home by the ragged hole in the back of their shirts. They are all exiles. They are all shoddy clothing. It is a code among them, like the path of a familiar thick bullet in the left shoulder blade. So they are exiles together. They are alone together. As this book pulls together these really contradictory ideas. And I think this is something that carries through because it's the contradiction as well of sort of a theme throughout the book almost becomes compassion in the face of yeah. the bleak, kindness in the face of hardship. You know, these contradictory yeah. ideas that the working people bring together themselves. This Did is not a book this? with a Mr. Uh, Daddy Warbucks, as it were, that like is doing the kind things for everybody. And you see this. Uh, the, the, this act of kindness there's a moment um i think to, towards the beginning of the book i've read this book so many times that i just know it by heart at this point when rather than quoting specific passages but where a nun almost falls off a bridge that's being built right major construction work here um and these nuns wanted to walk home get lost and one of them almost falls off a bridge and a worker saves her 
right? Mm -hmm. And this act of compassion that you're talking about is very much displayed here where, you know, they don't understand each other. The worker is, if I remember correctly, a Ukrainian immigrant um, or some kind of Eastern European immigrant. And there's this connection of understanding that both of them are looking for salvation in some way, shape or form, mm -hmm. um, despite the horrible nature of both of their lives in many ways, right? Living in modern Toronto. Um, on the one hand, for the nun, the lack of faith that is pervasive uh, in the post-war era, um, and for the worker, right, the lack of living conditions, mm -hmm. right, or basic living conditions. And, you know, finding something greater than themselves together um, is what kind of brings them together in this really interesting way in the book um, and serves as you're saying, the wider uh, themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but very good uh, passage uh, that you. you brought up. Yeah. Now back to the um, skin of a lion. Yeah. Sorry, I, I thought I, you were going to say something. Yeah, go ahead. I, yes, I did. I found one other passage that I think I was looking at. Mm -hmm. yep. And then this is just sort of like the end of the book in general. Again, this sort of, it's really interesting because the book, it almost ends with them exiling themselves. Yeah. The book yep. ends with them basically stealing a yacht and then, then fucking off. <laughs> it's great. They steal a yacht and then they fuck off to who knows where and Patrick takes care of his... Is it his daughter? Adopted daughter? I don't uh, know. Yes. But he's Probably. found his family. He is exiled himself with outcast of his own. And there's a really important message in there that, again, the worker can leave. A worker can just get up and leave. They need you just as much as you need them. Easier said than done. But oh, yes. for sure. And like that's but why remember, that's stay why Patrick... in your lane. <laughs> just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah, just tuck those bootstraps there. even tighter, baby. But I don't know if we want to keep going because we're getting pretty close to there was <laughs> very one last thing episode. I wanted to uh, yeah, I there was just one last one that I wanted to come up with. Um the idea of mapping that oh, I think yeah. is is good to to talk about. Now, what's and mapping, trying to, Patrick? But just the idea of delimitating specifically where something is, right, um, is, of course, important. But also, it very clearly sets the boundaries of what is acceptable or not, or what is perceived as mm -hmm. inside and outside a particular community, right? Um to ask the question, what is a Canadian is intrinsically an act of mapping, whether it's on a, a, on a physical map or a theoretical map, so to speak. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense. I to guess. Me. Okay. It makes sense um, as much as the rest of this episode does. Which is to say, no not sense at all. at all. And um, where was it? Yeah, the, basically, there's a section at the start um, where he, um, where uh, Patrick is looking um, at, uh, or no, sorry, Patrick's father, if I remember correctly, was looking mm -hmm. at a map. And he mentions, right, he was born into a region which did not appear on a map until 1910, uh, though his family had worked there for 20 years and the land had been homesteaded since 1850. Mm -hmm. right. And this kind of cuts, comes back in with what we've been talking about before, is like recognition versus um, versus actual lived experience. Yeah. His family had worked there for 20 years, and the land had been homesteaded since 1815. By that point, 100 years between when it was actually worked on and people labored on it, versus when it was recognized as being like worthy of being mapped, right? Mm -hmm. Um, which is, of course, when the authorities come in and, and so on and dictate what's properly a part of something or not, right? Um, and so all of this labor, right, that made it into a place that is literally on the map is invisible because mm. before then, no one cared, right? It was not worthy of it, right? And so again, this is Andachi kind of pointing to, you know, what is the recognized or what is the visible in society and why is it's important to shine a light on the invisible, right? For Make sure. it visible once more because otherwise it's lost to history. 
right? Mm -hmm. And he does so through really interesting, I think the the use of maps is a very interesting way of going about it. I just wanted to mention that. But uh, no, I'm down. Mapping do be important. It do be like that. Do be like All right, Matt. All right. I think Thanks for gonna... this weird and wild episode. <laughs> to bring it back to Michael and Dachi, I think we're going to have to call it there. Um, this is so, a weird. Why don't you year. tell us where Michael and Dachi can listen to our podcast? You listen to our podcast everywhere. If Michael and Dachi listens to our podcast, I would, I would die immediately. There's <laughs> die, no go to heaven. That... Die, go to heaven, burn in hell, baby. Let's go. Just whatever. I would just be happy. Okay. <laughs> well, we've peaked. So if Michael no and Dachi what... wanted to support the podcast, he could do so through <laughs> PayPal as it pays what he feels the show is worth. Or using our affiliate links, but that's okay, Michael. You do you. I'm calling you Michael now because we're buddies, right? We got to know each other really well over this last hour and a half. You're a talented writer. <laughs> I'm insane. It's fine. You can also, Michael, just to let you know, you can find perks like extra and ad-free episodes on Patreon. But as always, Michael, I want you to know this is all free and optional so we can remain free and independent, just like the unions that you'd like to stay in for, Mr. Ondachi. I'm switching to Mr. Andachi now because I feel like Michael's too informal. Oh, okay. But All right. Mr. Andachi, if you could leave a review on iTunes and let your friends know, tell Margaret Atwood we love her. That'd be great. But no matter what happens, we'll keep bringing this to the people's ears just the way that God intended. Now back to Michael Andachi. We'll see you next time on a story Canadiana. Cheers. Bye, everyone. <laughs>